Welcome to Sweet Taste of Liberty, the kickoff live stream for this year from the Lehman Center for American History. I'm Ann Thornton, Vice Provost and University Librarian at Columbia. We are delighted to be partnering once again with the Forum at Columbia, which is co-sponsoring this event, and with C-SPAN's American History TV, which will air this program in the future. Thank you so much for joining us for this important discussion, which launches the center's new annual theme, Slavery and Its Afterlives. The Lehman Center, a partnership between the Department of History and Columbia University Libraries, embarked on a redefined mission last year to inform civic engagement and social responsibility by examining the histories that shape urgent needs our society must address. I'm especially delighted to introduce our panel tonight. Dr. Caleb McDaniel, our featured speaker, is Mary Gibbs Jones Professor of Humanities and Chair of the Department of History at Rice University. Professor McDaniel specializes in 19th century U.S. history, slavery, and emancipation, as well as the American Civil War era. His latest book, Sweet Taste of Liberty, A True Story of Slavery and Restitution in America, was published by Oxford University Press and was awarded the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for History and the, and the Avery O. Craven Award from the Organization of American Historians. In addition to scholarly publications, he has written essays that have appeared in the New York Times, Smithsonian, The Atlantic, and Time. He is an active leader in American public history initiatives. I'm also very pleased to introduce our interlocutor, Jordan Brewington, who is Reparative Justice Legal Fellow and 2021-22 Justice Catalyst Fellow. Jordan graduated as a history major from Columbia College and recently completed her law degree at Yale Law School. She researches, writes, and facilitates collective visioning around land-based and local reparations initiatives. She currently works alongside descendant communities in southeastern Louisiana to advocate for reparative justice and healing from the legacies of slavery. She writes at the intersection of property law and reparative justice theory. A recent publication, Dismantling the Master's House, Reparations on the American Plantation, explores the use of eminent domain to reparatively redistribute plantation land holdings in southeastern Louisiana for descendants of enslaved persons. Lastly, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague at Columbia University and our moderator, Dr. Stephanie McCurry, R. Gordon Hoxie Professor of American History in honor of Dwight D. Eisenhower at Columbia. Professor McCurry is currently a co-chair of the Lehman Center for American History, along with Professor Frank Garitti of Columbia, who is a co-chair, and Lehman curator Ty Jones, who is associate director of the center. Professor McCurry's work specializes in the American Civil War and Reconstruction, the 19th century United States and the American South. Her current focus is on the epic human drama of processes of reconstruction in the 19th and 20th centuries. Her book, Confederate Reckoning, Power and Politics in the Civil War South, won the Frederick Douglass Award and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. She is a member of the advisory board of the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. Professor McCurry will moderate a discussion with our panelists who will also field inquiries from the audience. We encourage you to submit your questions using the online tool available in this live stream. At the conclusion of tonight's program, I will provide closing remarks, including information on a recent acquisition by Columbia's Rare Book and Manuscript Library, which has direct relevance to the long hidden histories of formerly enslaved women and their efforts to obtain legal redress 
for wrongs committed against them. Once again, thank you very much for joining us tonight, and we hope you will enjoy the program. And now I'll turn the virtual podium over to Professor Stephanie McCurry. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to see you all here. And as Anne said, this year, the Lehman Center for American History is hosting a speaker series on the theme slavery and its afterlives. And tonight is the first in that series. We'll have two more events in spring semester. So I just wanna say a little bit about what we're thinking about in choosing that theme. The idea that slavery had and has an afterlife that carries significant material meaning into the 21st century and which requires a program of reparative justice emerged in a variety of scholarly and public forums in recent years. The term offers a way to conceptualize the connection between the past and the present for people of African descent in the United States and other parts of the world impacted or shaped by the African slave trade. This idea has a long history or this movement has a long history dating back to reparations movements of enslaved and formerly enslaved people in the 19th century, but it has also gained strength and currency through the impact of recent activism, journalism, and scholarship. In that vein, I think of the work of scholars like Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow, our colleague Sadia Hartman, starting with her first book, Scenes of Subjection, and journalists like Tana Nahasi Coates and his 2014 essay, The Case for Reparations, which he published in The Atlantic, and most recently and centrally, Nicole Hannah Jones's blockbuster 1619 project for the New York Times, which as I'm sure you know, is now the target of Republican legislators and right-wing culture warriors. In settling on this capacious theme, uh, our idea, the directors, myself, Frank Garidi and Ty Jones, our idea is to use it to engage questions about the meaning of enslavement as a central theme and force in American history and life from the 1850s to the present. So in that sense, it's openly and sort of definitely a, a, a history of the present. But far from dictating any position, we think of it as a way to pose a series of questions with the hope of opening up a conversation across disciplines and specializations. What does the idea of afterlives offer or mean as a conception of historical time? One that spans and potentially collapses the considerable distance from the 17th century or even the 19th century to the present? What does it mean for an understanding of emancipation as a meaningful break in historical time? We're also interested in thinking about whether there are differences between the humanistic disciplines in their embrace or use of this concept or framework? Um, and what are the implications for contemporary activism? One of the reasons we're so delighted to have Jordan Brewington with us tonight. Can we talk of abolitionism beyond the historically specific movement to end the system of enslavement of Black people in the US and elsewhere? And if we can, what does it mean to be an abolitionist today? These are the kinds of questions and conversations we hope to engage starting tonight and over the course of the academic year. In addition to Professor McDaniel, who is our lead speaker tonight, our own colleagues and former students are key interlocutors in this series, starting as you just heard from Jordan Brewington, who's talking to us tonight and who Ann Thornton just introduced. But in the spring, we will also have Sarah Haley, our new colleague in history, and Sadia Hartman, our colleague in English and Comp Lit, whose work is at the very center of this debate and this scholarship. And that event will be in February, 2022. And the final event will involve Elizabeth Hinton, a former PhD student in history at Columbia, who's now at Yale History and Law, and who will headline the event in March, and will be joined by our, our current colleague, Professor Jelani Cobb from the Journalism School. And so with that, I just wanna say how excited we are to launch this annual series tonight with Caleb McDaniel and Jordan Brewington. And with that, I'm gonna turn over to Professor McDaniel, who will introduce all of us to the subject of his outstanding book, Sweet Taste of Liberty. Thank you so much, Stephanie.
for that warm introduction. And thank you to all of the organizers of this event. It's truly an honor to be speaking with you this evening, especially after he hearing about the many distinguished historians who will be speaking in this series after me. Let me begin with a story about a lawyer. On August 8th, 1948, the Chicago Sunday Tribune published a profile about an African-American lawyer named Arthur H. Sims, a quote, one-time slave who had been practicing law in Chicago for more than 50 years. According to the Tribune, he had been born enslaved in Mississippi in 1856 to a mother described only as a laundress, and he remained active even at the ripe old age of 92. A deputy clerk who was interviewed for the article and is pictured here next to Arthur Sims said that the lawyer was the oldest attorney still practicing in the city and, quote, just seemed to go on forever. Sims had indeed seen a lot in his years in Chicago. In 1887, he became one of the first African-American graduates of the Union College of Law, a two-year program whose alumni included a future governor of Illinois and the populist politician and presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryan. Here is Sims pictured with his graduating class of 1889 from the Union College, which a few years later became what is now Northwestern University's School of Law. In the years after his graduation, Sims made a name for himself on the south side of Chicago as the people's lawyer. His bread and butter cases were those of a general practice attorney, defending those accused of small criminal scrapes, handling divorces. But he had some big cases as well. After the bloody Chicago race riots of 1919, in which 23 black Chicagoans were killed by white mobs and another 300 were injured, Sims and a team of lawyers successfully defended a black woman named Emma Jackson from a murder charge by proving that she had fired on a white rioter in self-defense. And by that time, Sims had also become well-known in the African-American community as a promoter of Black-owned businesses. In 1905, he spoke about the topic at one of the literary societies that frequently met at Black churches in the city, titling his lecture with one word, progress. In 1948, however, the Chicago Tribune did not say much about Sims's long career, other than the fact that it had been long. The reporter seemed most impressed by the lawyer's longevity, and the article said that Sims credited his advanced age to some sage advice he had received in 1878. Quote, an old doctor once told Arthur H. Sims that if he learned only what was good and kept adding to it, he would live long and sleep well at night. Sims heeded the advice given him in 1878, and the wisdom kept him well. He will be 93 next January, and he sleeps well at night. The Tribune did not identify who the old doctor was who handed Sims the keys to a good night's sleep and a long life in 1878. Perhaps he was a college professor. We know a thing or two about putting people to sleep. But I did not come here tonight to talk to you about sleep or hopefully to put you to sleep. I actually came here to tell you about something else far more interesting, I believe, that happened in Sims's life in the year 1878, an event that I think was even more crucial in explaining his long career in the law than the advice he got from a doctor that same year. For 1878 was also the year when Sims's mother, a formerly enslaved woman named Henrietta Wood, won the largest known sum ever awarded by a US court in restitution for slavery. Her story, the story of Henrietta Wood, is the one I tell in my book, Sweet Taste of Liberty. And it's a story without which Arthur Sims's story would not be complete. So let me briefly summarize the story of the book, which follows Henrietta Wood across multiple state lines over nearly a century. Now, unlike her son, no image of Henrietta Wood survives today. But we know that her life began in Northern Kentucky 
on the southern banks of the Ohio River, where Henrietta was born enslaved around 1818 or 1820. She could never be sure exactly which. At the age of 14, she later remembered, like many enslaved children in the Upper South at that time, she was traumatically separated from her family and sold for the first time to a merchant in Louisville. He sold her again a few years later to another merchant who forced Wood to accompany him to New Orleans, where she lived for about six or seven years before returning to Kentucky. Eventually, however, Henrietta Wood experienced what very few of the millions of people enslaved in the American South before the Civil War did. In 1848, she won her freedom after her legal owner at the time moved with Wood to Cincinnati, a state whose constitution had outlawed slavery from the beginning. As Wood later recalled of that fateful day in 1848, quote, my mistress gave me my freedom and my papers were recorded in the Hamilton County, Ohio courthouse, papers that proved she was free. Wood soon found, however, that freedom in antebellum America, even in a free state, was always a fragile thing. In July 1849, the courthouse where her freedom papers were officially recorded burned to the ground, leaving her only with a copy of the papers in her personal possession. And then in 1853, Wood was lured by her employer at the time into a carriage and taken against her will across the Ohio River into Kentucky, where she was cruelly kidnapped and re-enslaved by a man named Zebulon Ward. The kidnappers later crossed the river to find and confiscate Wood's personal copy of her freedom papers too. Now, I first learned about that kidnapping in the fall of 2014, when I read an interview that Wood gave about her ordeal many years after she had regained her freedom. And I have to say, sad though it is, that the kidnapping of a free Black woman in 1853 was not the part of the interview that surprised me the most. Historians of this period know that the kidnapping and enslavement of free Black people was not uncommon in the years before the Civil War. The reason was a combination of anti-Black racism and greed. On the eve of the Civil War, the four million people enslaved in the United States were worth an estimated $3 billion to their legal owners, more than all the factories and railroads in the country combined. Kidnapping gangs in the Upper South knew that if they could capture and sell free Black people into the Lower South, they could reap a huge profit. Historian Richard Bell has even recently estimated that the thousands of free people kidnapped and enslaved from the North may even have been roughly equal to the number of enslaved people who escaped from the South on the better known Underground Railroad. One of the most famous victims of kidnapping, of course, was Solomon Northup, a free Black New Yorker whose memoir of his kidnapping and sale to a Louisiana plantation was dramatized in the Oscar-winning movie, 12 Years a Slave. Wood's story differed from Northup's, however, in two important respects. First, abolitionists and allies in New York intervened in the case of Solomon Northup, who regained his freedom and was reunited with his family in 1853, only a few months before Wood was kidnapped. Wood, on the other hand, would not taste freedom again until after the Civil War and the legal abolition of slavery. Like Northup, Wood never did accept her re-enslavement. She fought. In fact, only hours after her kidnapping, she spoke in secret to a sympathetic innkeeper in Kentucky who believed Wood's story that she had been wrongfully enslaved. A lawyer in Lexington was engaged to help and a lawsuit was even filed in a Fayette County, Kentucky court, alleging that Wood was a free woman. That case proved to be important later on, and its outcome was not a foregone conclusion. In earlier decades, some Kentucky courts had sometimes ruled that a person who had established domicile in a free state, as Wood had in her five years of freedom in Cincinnati, remained free 
even if brought into Kentucky. Wood's case, however, failed to convince the Fayette County Court, who dismissed her freedom suit. Wood's lawyer appealed the decision to Kentucky's state Supreme Court, but there the case failed again in 1855. In truth, while not a foregone conclusion, that outcome was also not surprising. The willingness of Southern state courts and legislatures to grant freedom in freedom suits waned to a vanishing point in the decade before the Civil War. The legal system at the time was stacked against Wood, who was presumed a slave unless she could prove that she was free. Consider the fact that her kidnapper and the defendant in the freedom suit was Zebulon Ward, a man who had been serving as a deputy sheriff in Kentucky when he helped to orchestrate Wood's abduction. Between the kidnapping and the decision of the state Supreme Court, Wood also pursued and received a new job as the appointed superintendent of the Kentucky State Penitentiary in Frankfurt. In that position, Ward was allowed to force the prisoners in the penitentiary to work for his own profit. He became a pioneer of the use of convict labor to enrich private firms who leased prisoners and penitentiaries from the state, a practice that predated the Civil War, but later expanded across the American South, creating a racialized regime of incarceration and forced labor that one writer has called slavery by another name, and another citing a contemporary source described as worse than slavery. After the Civil War, Ward would go on to manage state penitentiaries in two other states, Tennessee and Arkansas, making several fortunes by exploiting the labor of prisoners who were disproportionately Black. When he died in 1894, Zebulon Ward passed on an estate worth some $600,000 to his family, making him a multimillionaire in today's terms. That was the man who kidnapped and according to the state of Kentucky, now legally owned Henrietta Wood. And after he defeated her freedom suit in 1855, he eventually sold her to slave traders who took her down the river to Natchez, Mississippi. There in one of the largest slave markets in the deep south, a place known as Forks of the Road, Wood was bought by a cotton planter who put her to work under brutal conditions in the fields and in his house a place called Brandon Hall. And it was there that she gave birth to Arthur H. Sims, who was born, as the Chicago Tribune later reported, in January 1856, quote, on a farm 11 miles from Natchez, Mississippi. His mother had been sold to the plantation owner, a man named Gerard Brandon, only a month before his birth. Now, Wood and Sims remained in bondage at Brandon Hall, which remains standing today and is pictured here, when the Civil War began in 1861. But in 1863, as Union armies began to close in on the Natchez district, ready to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation issued earlier that year, Gerard Brandon decided to run. He forced some 300 enslaved people on the road and made them march some 400 miles to Texas, settling for the duration of the war on rented land in Robertson County. Henrietta Wood and her young son, Arthur, were among those whom Brandon brought all that way to Texas. After the long march, she later remembered that she arrived broken down and sick from exposure to the elements, forced to use crutches for an entire year. And she remained there in Texas, still enslaved and beyond the reach of US armies until months after the surrender of General Lee at Appomattox. But Henrietta Wood's story did not end in Texas. In 1869, a full 16 years after her kidnapping and four years after the passage of the 13th Amendment, she managed to return to the Cincinnati area with her son, Arthur, still alive and by her side. She began working as a domestic worker for a lawyer in Covington, Kentucky, 
named Harvey Myers. At some point, she unfolded for Myers her long ordeal at the hands of Zebulon Ward, whose name she had never forgotten. And then in 1870, with Myers' legal help, she filed a remarkable lawsuit against Zebulon Ward in the Superior Court of Cincinnati. The lawsuit laid out all that had happened since 1853, and it demanded that Ward pay $20,000 in damages and lost wages for her many years of enslavement. Now, I've already foreshadowed the outcome of this case, but uh, before I give you the specifics, here's a question I've often been asked by readers about it. How unusual was Wood's lawsuit? And the answer is that it was both unsurprising and surprising at the same time. Unsurprising because enslaved and formerly enslaved people had articulated the demand for reparations from the earliest days of the nation's history and would continue making the demand long after Wood's lawsuit. In 2014, just a few months before I began researching this book, an influential article by the award-winning journalist ta Coates revived conversations about what he called the case for reparations. But the struggle for reparations long predated that piece. At the turn of the century, another formerly enslaved woman, Callie House, would lead a large grassroots movement of African Americans who lobbied Congress for, quote, ex-slave pensions. And in the 1850s, abolitionists in New York had even lobbied the state legislature to provide compensation to Solomon Northup, who I mentioned earlier. And those are just two examples of many reparations claims made over the years. But in other respects, Wood's case was surprising and unusual. Unlike the vast majority of formerly enslaved people, her specific claim of having been freed and re-enslaved, of having been kidnapped and wrongfully enslaved, gave her a special legal standing, even if her petition did go beyond claiming damages for Ward's act of kidnapping to include a claim for lost wages and the many abuses suffered during her bondage to someone other than Ward. And Wood's case was surprising for another reason. Callie House's movement was defeated. Solomon Northup was never paid. But in 1878, after eight long years of litigation that included the removal of the suit to a federal court, Wood finally got a verdict in the case of Wood v. Ward, and the jury decided in her favor. When the verdict came, 25 years had passed since Wood was kidnapped across the Ohio River and back into slavery. Her son, Arthur, born into slavery because of that act, was now a 22-year-old man and stood in the courtroom that day when the jury filed in to read the verdict. Both must have taken some satisfaction in the outcome, though it would have been tinged with disappointment too. After all, Wood had sued Ward for $20,000, but in its verdict, the jury awarded her only $2,500, a tiny fraction of her claim. Plus, Ward immediately objected to the verdict and moved for a new trial, which forced Wood to wait another year to learn whether the verdict would stand. In fact, Wood was still waiting in 1879 when she gave the newspaper interview where I first encountered her story. In that article, she told the reporter of her victory over Zebulon Ward, but said she was still waiting for him to, quote, pass over them checks. When I first started the research on this book in the fall of 2014, that left me wondering if Ward ever did pass over the checks. In the fall of 2015, hoping to answer that question, I traveled to the Chicago branch of the National Archives, where the records of the now defunct Sixth Circuit U.S. Court for the Southern District of Ohio had been relocated in 1953. There, I found the original case file containing the papers from Wood's lawsuit. And among those papers was a document that proved Ward did pay the $2,500 to Wood. As you can see here, it was labeled as a satisfaction. After receiving the checks, Wood and Sims moved together to Chicago 
where Wood lived out the rest of her years before dying in 1912 at the age of 92 or 94. And that brings us back to where we started this evening with the story of her similarly long-lived son, Arthur Sims. Sims would live in Chicago until his death in 1951, practicing law and presiding over a large clan that included grandchildren and great-grandchildren. His descendants, through his son Arthur Jr. and his daughter Nita, included a grandson trained as a Tuskegee Airman during World War II, a jazz musician in post-war Chicago, and a host of African-American professionals, including a librarian, a doctor, and a computer systems engineer. Here he is with one of his great-grandchildren, possibly poring over a law book in a photograph taken around the same time as the profile of Sims in the Chicago Tribune, where we began. As you'll recall, the Chicago Tribune said that Sims credited the advice he received from a doctor in 1878 for his good health and long career. But equally important, important I hope to have shown, was the verdict his mother received in the very same year. More important, in fact. $2,500 was not a lot of money compared to Ward's riches, of course. But $2,500 in 1878 would be worth more than $60,000 today. Partly with the help of that money, Sims would purchase a house in Chicago in 1885, very close to where the University of Chicago stands today. Few wage earning families in Chicago at the time could afford to purchase homes without a loan from a friend or a family member. And the number of black homeowners was especially small. To pay the $1,150 outright for the house, Arthur Sims must have turned to someone with enough capital to help him acquire real estate, someone such as his mother, Henrietta Wood. That house proved to be a fruitful asset for Wood and for Sims, particularly as a means of acquiring cash. Using his equity in the house, he borrowed $800 in 1888, midway through the legal studies that he began after buying it. It was the first of several mortgages that Sims would take out and pay off before the century turned. The Chicago Tribune, though, told only a shortened version of this story in 1948, drawing the easier conclusion that the venerable barrister had, quote, pulled himself up, pulled himself up from slavery. In pulling himself up from slavery, however, Sims also had some help that most other sons of enslaved women did not. And it seems more than possible that his mother's story also played a greater role in his interest in the law than his interview with the Chicago Tribune led on. He mightily believes in the power and insight of judges, the Tribune reported in 1948, a belief possibly seeded, though the paper did not say it, by his experiences watching his mother's suit make its way through the federal courts many years before. In any event, it seems safe to conclude that her extraordinary legal victory had taught him what the law and the courts could sometimes do and may have made it possible for him to do law. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Caleb, so much for that talk. Um, which I think our audience can already see positions us squarely in the very last days of legal slavery in the United States and the question of reparations, the urgent question in the critical decades immediately after the Civil War. Uh, and we're really lucky to have with us tonight also Jordan Brewington, who, as we mentioned, was a graduate, is a graduate of Columbia and Yale Law School. Who, and Jordan's work focuses on approaches to reparations in the present moment as in now, not just a historian, and on a, particularly on ideas about how this can be done meaningfully, how, uh, how, how this can be done meaningfully through reparative processes that focus on particular descendants of slavery, in particular very rooted local places or communities, in some cases near the plantations on which their ancestors labor. Jordan also has a very co concrete idea for one kind of reparations that might be paid, as she put it, one way to use the master's tool 
to dismantle or at least repurpose the, the, the resources of the master's house. So you can see, and I think we'll all see by the end of her comments, how having Jordan here with us tonight allows us to broaden the conversation and begin exploring the questions that I mentioned at the outset about slavery and its afterlives and the way we ought to think of the connections and the ruptures between the past and the present. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jordan. Thank you all. Thanks to everyone um, for putting this event together, for welcoming me to share in conversation and just share a bit about my work. Um, and I've just really appreciated uh, Professor McDaniel listening to you and just getting a chance to reflect or re-reflect on Henrietta Woods' story um, in preparation for this conversation. Um, when I think about Henrietta Woods' story, I think about a powerful lineage across time, which I describe in the introduction of my note and which Professor McDaniel just raised of Black folks who have been resisting the institution of slavery, you know, demanding reparations and seeking to practice liberation for just about as long as the institution of slavery has existed in the United States. Um, I think of Quack Walker, a Black man who was enslaved in Massachusetts and who sued his owner in 1781 um, for freedom that had been promised to him but was denied to him. And I think of Belinda Sutton, a Black woman who was enslaved also in the 18th century by the royal family um, who are now famous, you know, Harvard Law School benefactors. Belinda petitioned in front of a state legislative body for a, a pension for herself and her daughter so that they could survive after Belinda was essentially manumitted um, by Isaac Royal um, in his will. And learning about Kwok and Belinda and Henrietta was an important intervention in my life uh, and also in my work in that it instilled in me, you know, what reparations have always been about. Um, and first, that would be a demand for accountability for our suffering by those who have harmed us. Um, I'm thinking of Henrietta, you know, in 1870, seeking damages for her re-enslavement, even after, you know, becoming free again, still wanting that accountability for what had, for the ways in which she'd been harmed. Um, and additionally, I think, you know, that it raises that reparations has always been about a demand to redistribute resources that are being presently hoarded by some in order for Black folks to meet our own needs. Thinking about Belinda, for example, seeking a pension from the royal family estate to support both herself and her daughter's livelihoods. That spirit, that desire um, for accountability for the harms that we've experienced as Black people and an understanding that resources, money, and also land must be redistributed in order for Black folks to meet our own needs and thus to truly experience liberation. That is what I believe to be central to reparations. I think accountability and redistribution must be at the center of every conversation, every effort, every program and movement towards reparations in our country. Um, and this piece around accountability and redistribution is central to my note, Dismantling the Master's House, um, Reparations on the American Plantation, which calls us to consider on a local level with a particular, sometimes public and sometimes private, depending upon which plantation institution um, the Plantation Museum. And I'll just give a really quick summary of my piece. Um, in southeastern Louisiana, where I'm currently, um, one of the ways that I think settler colonialism and slavery really manifested themselves was via the plantation system, right? The famed sugarcane plantations in Louisiana, um, originally the ancestral homelands of the Chittimacha, Homa Nation, Choctaw Indians who were pushed out to make way for indigenous Africans and African Americans who were then forced to live and work, um, you know, experience pockets of joy um, and also unfathomable suffering until they died on those plantations. Um, and these plantations following emancipation actually continued to operate and even increased in their operational capacity for a time. Um, which they were able to do because they continued to rely on the labor of those who were formerly enslaved on those plantations and also their descendants well into the 20th century. I always use this example, um, but at Whitney Plantation, for instance, um, in Wallace, Louisiana, 
Black men and women continued to harvest sugarcane in the sugarcane fields and continued to live in the same cabins as their former, you know, enslaved ancestors until the 1970s. Um, so many of these plantations, you know, were also destroyed over time or purchased by corporations in the petrochemical industry, which we can get into later, maybe. Um, but some that remained were converted into plantation museums that are toured by hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of tourists a year. Um, and my piece focuses on that particular institution, the Plantation Museum, and it uplifts many of the experiences that individuals have had visiting and um, working at plantation museums um, over time. It's the voices of tour guides and, um, you know, tourism geographers, historians, um, and also the voices of the local Black descendant community who fill, you know, my piece, my note. Um, and so I, I sort of took all of those harms that they had described and categorized them um, into economic narrative, and systemic harms that occurred across time, right? So they were historically committed on plantations, and I argue are presently being perpetuated by the plantation tourism industry. For example, I argue that um, plantations were the sites of historical economic disenfranchisement, right? Obviously through the institution of slavery, forced labor, um, unpaid labor, and also through post-emancipation oppression thinking about convict leasing, which um, Professor McDaniel, you know, speaks to um, in his book, you know, Zeb Zebulon Ward, in fact, profited from these sort of institutions. Um, debt peonage was also um, more common um, practice in the plantations in St. John the Baptist Parish. The concept, right, of slavery by another name or worse than slavery, as Professor McDaniel had just um, spoken to. Um, and that that was a sort of a historical, you know, economic disenfranchisement. But that plantation museums, I argue, are also perpetuating that harm. Um, they are themselves sites of contemporary economic disenfranchisement, as they literally reap benefits. They reap ticket sales um, and all sorts of additional monetary um, benefits from slavery tours, um, also vacation stays, uh, hosting plantation weddings and other elite events. Um, while failing to redistribute any of that monetary resources um, to descendants of the enslaved, many of whom, as I mentioned before, live right around these plantations and continue to struggle with economic instability. Another example, um, I mentioned that I argue about narrative harms. I argue that plantations were the sites of historical narrative violence, right? Um, sites where the myths of Black inferiority and subhumanity were created and proliferated by and for white subjects. And we can even think of a similar narrative violence when we think back to um, Professor McDaniel's book, um, when he talks about the ways that Zebulon Ward, um, you know, told these fairy tales, these fables um, after Henrietta's case, where he would, for instance, lie about the time that she spent in bondage, claiming that it was less than over a decade, or, you know, say that he actually desired to set her free, um, which is obviously untrue. He was, in fact, the reason why she was forced back into re-enslavement, right? So thinking about those narrative harms as well, I argue that plantation museums perpetuate that harm um, and continue that legacy of harm in particular through producing false um, and violent narratives um, about the experience of slavery on those sites. For example, presenting um, the story of slavery uh, through the perspective of the slave owning family's love story, as they used to at Oak Alley Plantation, um, or telling tourists that plantation owners were just like us, right? Um, these things that continue to not only support racist ideas, but possibly racist actions and ultimately help keep Black Americans in a state of subjugation. Um, I also speak to structural inequities, right, that are perpetuated on the plantation. Um, historically, you know, these are the earliest sites of racialized hierarchical um, systems of labor in the United States. They are, in fact, the engines of racial capitalism, right? Um, and I argue that the Plantation Museum continues this harm, you know, um, by locking descendants out of positions of power and authority within the Plantation Museum. Uh, as far as I understand to this day, Whitney Plantation appears to be the only plantation museum on River Road that has direct descendants of, um, you know, folks that were enslaved on that plantation in positions of authority or Black people in general. Um, and so I, I lay out that, um, you know, 
picture of all of these injustices carried from the historical sense into the present. And then I utilize the Movement for Black Lives um, collective vision for reparations and reparations theory and discourse within American legal writing to imagine you know, what reparations within this local institution might actually look like specifically for communities that are surrounding these plantations, as I mentioned before, who I name descendants. And this piece then analyzes how um, this case for local reparations could actually become possible, right? Um, how one powerful legal tool, the power um, of eminent domain, could assist in making these larger reparations projects more possible. And I focus on um, land-based repair, because that's what motivates my spirit and interests me. Um, I recall even Professor McDaniel just mentioned this, um, that Henrietta Woods' descendants were able to maintain financial security um, via the equity, I think you said, in their homes um, as property owners. And um, that has really motivated my interest within the reparations movement. But in this note, I focus on how um, descendants um, and really the state legislature, the Louisiana state legislature, is empowered to transfer plantation holdings to descendants. Um, because I ultimately feel that once those lands can be stewarded by Black descendants, once that tool is wielded by descendants to redistribute those properties, a lot of the other necessary parts of a healing initiative, truth telling, you know, the psycho spiritual elements, um, the narrative work, the cultural work, and the systemic work that is necessary to a successful reparations project can be realized more full, fully. Um, yeah, and I also take a moment to talk a bit about the benefits of local reparations. Municipalities, right? Evanston, Asheville, Chicago, the ones you might have heard of, states as well, um, and private and public institutions coming up with reparative processes themselves, um, and how the local processes need to be experimental and iterative. I argue that local processes need to look at the stories of Henrietta Wood and Callie House and contemporary stories like. Deidre Farmer Paleman and her lawsuits, right, as guides for what reparations can be, but that they also require us to look internally into the ways that the legacies of slavery show up in our own lives and bodies and question what does reparations look like in the particular places, right? The cities, the parishes in Louisiana, the educational institutions such as Columbia that we occupy. Um, and so in the note, I talk about, you know, how local reparations processes are also incredible, valuable, incredibly valuable to the national plan, right, that must also happen in terms of actually alerting national stakeholders to what the needs are in different localities. Um, I think the national movement could really benefit from being informed by the successes and setbacks of local efforts. And something that really troubles me, and I think I kind of speak to it in the note, um, about the popular conversation around reparations on the national scale is its fixation on expertise and the idea that, you know, our political leaders, many of whom occupy spaces of elite wealth and power, should be the ones to decide what reparations should look like rather than communities who are informed about the unique ways the legacies of slavery show up in their lives. In my opinion, reparation should be a response to the harms that folks can actually, you know, name that they have experienced rather than something imagined by those in power. Um, additionally, uh, the, the note speaks a bit about, I guess you could call them peer institutions um, to the Plantation Museum that I mentioned in my paper. So both I speak about, you know, other instances, other plantation museums in the South, such as Brandon Hall, where um, I've just realized is um, where Henrietta Wood herself was enslaved. Um, and I argue, you know, the ways in which Brandon Hall and other, you know, peer plantation museums in Mississippi and South Carolina commit similar narrative harms to those in Louisiana. I also, um, you know, mention missions in California uh, my hometown, um, or my home state, rather, uh, sites that also, you know, played a central role in the processes of settler colonialism and sites where I grew up going to, um, you know, field trips every year and yet never learned about the atrocities committed against indigenous communities in California. Um, so this note was really a call to multiple stakeholders that I've identified within the reparations movement, as well as to descendants in this unique region of Louisiana. Um, and after writing it, I was fortunate enough to be given 
the opportunity to return to the river parishes and begin seeding discussions around reparations um, and healing. And that's the work that I'm committed to now. Um, however, I do have to mention um, that Hurricane Ida was a category four hurricane whose eye I was telling the group before, descendants believe traveled directly over their homes, directly over Whitney Plantation and the river parishes that I describe in my note. Um, and it devastated many descendant communities um, who are now trying to rebuild. And with mutual aid efforts, you know, growing each day, we're beginning to see the impacts of what a redistribution of monetary resources, what that type of redistributive effort could mean for the river parishes. Um, but I think it's Dean Spade in his book, Mutual Aid, uh, he says um, that every disaster creates a rupture. Um, you know, it's another opportunity, um, another moment to analyze how our societal, you know, infrastructure, how the ways that we move through the world um, are no longer serving us or our earth. Um, and I find that Hurricane Ida, this rupture has allowed for a more meaningful conversation around the continuity of injustices that are endured by Black folks in Louisiana, Indigenous communities in Louisiana, and the earth, um, and has really opened up um, an opportunity to talk around or talk about ecological reparations in the river parishes. Um, but to close, I, I say that um, I'd like to say that my note um, not only is meant to reveal, you know, the injustices perpetuated on the plantation, um, but I also spend some time dreaming about what the plantation museum could be one day, you know, sites for public memory um, in sort of the similar vein of Whitney Plantation, right, um, but also sites for racial healing and other public facing projects. Um, I point to an example of Resora Plantation in Georgia, founded by Shirley Sherrod, um, the famous Black farmer who sued the United States Department of Agriculture for racial discrimination, right? Um, and the beautiful um, ways in which that act of trauma ended up resulting in uh, an act of healing and repair. Um, I have to think about my friend and mention my friend and colleague, Joy Banner, who I quote at the start of my note, um, who actually wrote out Hurricane Ida storm in the big house at Whitney Plantation, a structure that was in fact built by her enslaved ancestors. Um, coincidentally, I ended up writing out the storm, um, e evacuating onto a former plantation in Alabama. Um, and in that moment of emergency, an urgency, um, we talked about, you know, what it meant to find refuge in these places um, and what it could mean for these historical sites of trauma to one day be sites of refuge, to one day be sites of organizing, sites of healing for the descendant community, housed in a structure, you know, supported by the beams of our ancestors, the ones that they laid for us. Um, and so I would like to leave you all with that image of what could be in the spirit of the reparations movement, which is always dreaming of what could be, always dreaming of the liberation to come. And with that, I thank you for having me today and look forward to talking more with Professor McDaniel and Professor McCurry. Well, I mean, we're all the beneficiaries of these amazing talks. And I think you can see you're giving us such hope for the year. Um, the rich materials that you've laid out in this 45 or 50 minutes uh, given us an amazing start. Um, Caleb's extremely uh, moving and detailed historical uh, reconstruction of one case and one woman's life. And Jordan, your uh, very urgent, immediate sense of the present and of what we can do now. Um, so we are going to open it to the audience, but before I just want to take the prerogative of the chair to have a chat with um, Caleb and Jordan and, and begin with a question for Caleb that comes from reading the book and, and listening tonight. Um, I was particularly moved in reading the book, Caleb, something you brought up at the end of your talk about the way you handled the question of the monetary uh, award that was paid to Henry, Henrietta Wood especially your suggestion or speculations about what it meant to her son um, and the life chances of her son. And I thought you did that incredibly well, uh, that it helped him buy a house and get a stake in the real estate market and possibly get a loan for medical school. In other words, that this wealth, not small, but considerable, um, had intergenerational effects that were really meaningful for him, for his children, his grandchildren, 
And clearly this is one of the ways in which this is a reparation story. But I thought I would ask you to be explicit about this. And I'm just super curious about you as a writer, about when you came to conceive of Henrietta Wood's story as a reparations story. Because it could be that, but it, of course it could be written in other ways. And if you, so when did it, did it start to hit you that this is the way this should be placed or framed? And what makes it that, like in thinking about our larger conversation, which Jordan has been adding a great number of suggestions to already, uh, what makes it a reparation story? And can we talk about reparations in reference to individual cases of damages paid? And one of the reasons that I ask you that, Caleb, is that I was really struck in reading your book that the judge who gave Henrietta Wood that award specifically instructed the jury to settle the case in a way that would not establish a legal precedent. This was opening the gate to a series of claims that would be urgent in the immediate aftermath uh, of emancipation. They literally did not want accountability for the crime of slavery. They wanted to get this case closed, but not open the floodgates because that would inv involve a huge number of people. Uh, so her case had to be an exception to the rule. It was, the jury was instructed to make it an exception to the rule. Um, so to the, to the question, what would justice require at that time covering the case, as you quoted, the New York Times answered by reminding its readers that this is a huge unsettled account and they wanted to leave it that way. So I'm just, I would just invite you to tell us more about when you came to frame it as a reparation story, what makes it that, whether an individual story, the, the, the um, unusual circumstances of the case are not accidental uh, from a legal point of view. Thank you for that question. And, and actually, I think my process went in, in the other direction. When I started researching the book, I was initially conceiving of it as a clear case of reparations. And as I mentioned, you know, I, I learned about Henrietta Wood's story in 2014, right at the same time that there was a, a renewed public conversation around reparations. Um, and I was interested in the question that, you know, there, there were lots of cases being made for and against reparations uh, by politicians, by pundits, by, by journalists. I was curious, though, if this could serve as a case, of, a rare case of reparations, that's something that might inform these current discussions. Um, but if you uh, if you notice, the subtitle of the book ended up being not a case of reparations, but a true story of slavery and restitution uh, in America. And that's partly because of, of some of the points you have just made, that uh, although in the end Wood did uh, win a, a victory in court, um, I don't think she received the kind of deeper acknowledgement and reckoning uh, with what she had suffered that Jordan was referring to earlier. You know, Zebulon Ward never uh, admitted fault. He was never held, you know, criminally accountable uh, for, for what had happened. And on the contrary, he often told a, a uh, uh, a series of lies about the case in the public press that did not even mention Henrietta Wood by name. Um, and so I think it's important to also, uh, you know, um, wrestle with the fact that we don't know how Wood herself uh, felt about the, the final outcome of the case. The interview that, that I shared in my presentation that she gave in 1879, as I said, she was still waiting to, to receive payment. Um, and although we have one other interview that she gave a few years before, that's the last um, uh, interview with her in the press. And so, um, you know, how, would she have regarded this uh, as as a case of repair in in the broader sense that uh, that Jordan was referring to? I think is a is a question worth leaving open. It's at least the right question to ask. I think you know what would how would she have regarded this? Um, but it's a question we can't fully answer now. I think we can look at, um, you know, her her son and 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 his family's ability to to buy a house as significant, nonetheless. Uh, you know, uh, there's there's a lesson here in this story about the big difference that even a small amount of restitution, particularly restitution that comes in the form of real property, 
uh, of wealth that can be uh, inherited and passed down and and accrued and used to to you know uh, to take out credit and and advance a family's financial security, uh, even a small amount uh, made a big difference. But at the same time, I think you're right that this is a story uh, that shows the limits of payment alone, uh, absent a larger reckoning, either on the national or also, you know, on the local level. Um, you know, Ward's name is is still on buildings in in Little Rock, Arkansas. For a time, his painting hung in the state capitol. Uh, you know, he he died a, not only a wealthy man, but rich in in the kinds of social capital that uh, enabled the continued the continuation of white supremacy at the end of the 19th century. And so uh, that's exactly why we're, we're continuing to have these conversations today. Well, thank you, Caleb. That's a really interesting answer. And of course, you can see where Jordan is building on your work on this question of, of, uh, of land and reparations. So Jordan, I have one question for you. I have another one for both of you, but we'll wait because I can tell you there's amazing questions coming in from the audience. So but let me just draw you out a little bit about something that I've been trying to understand, not being um, you know, so, so immersed in this uh, as you. Um, but the particular focus in your work that you explained to us today, the way it needs to center on lineal descendants, American descendants of slavery. Uh, and I know that this is a controversial issue within the reparations movement, uh, broadly defined. And I wondered if you could talk to us for a moment and orient us to the elements of this debate about the way the focus on American descendants of slavery, specific descendants, is compatible with the larger national and even transnational um, reckoning with slavery that other proponents of reparations call for. Um, from your point of view and from what I hear you saying, these are not disconnected things. These are connected things. But the, uh, the question of who reparations should be addressed to, as I understand it, can be a, a controversial and divisive issue. And I wondered if you would talk about that, how you see it centering your uh, thinking on, uh, on the importance of centering the thinking on the lineal descendants uh, of, of enslaved people. Yes, thank you for your question. And I, I hope that I can answer it to you. The, the first thing that comes to mind when you asked is, the controversy between groups such as ADOS, which is the American descendants of slaves, who essentially, for folks who don't know, argue that um, reparations efforts, particularly the national movement towards reparations, needs to focus on, like, you know, folks who can trace their lineages to, um, you know, enslaved African and African American people who were enslaved on the lands that we know as the United States. Um, and, you know, you know, controversy arises from that when you have folks such as myself, whose father, um, you know, my patrilineal side was enslaved in South Carolina and my matrilineal side was enslaved in St. Kitts, right? Um, and I think that I will say to, to sort of support in some ways the, the things that those folks ADOS is, are saying um, is that, you know, there have been a lot of conversation and writings about the different experiences that Black folks have had, um, you know, grappling with racialization, um, the oppression of um, white supremacy um, in the United States based off of, you know, when our ancestors in, um, you know, were either forced to migrate here or chose to migrate here, um, the ways in which we've been able to navigate these institutions um, and the ways in which we've been able to, you know, make a way for our, for our descendants. Um, at the same time, I will say that my interest in focusing on direct lineage stems from what the Movement for Black Lives would call a, system, a systematic accounting, acknowledgement, and repair of past and ongoing harms, just kind of like one of their many definitions of reparations. And to me, what's most valuable is not picking and choosing um, you know, which descendants um, ought to receive reparations, because the fact of the matter is, as long as you're a Black body occupying, you know, form in the United States, you can be subject to the violence of the state. And we have seen that most powerfully last summer in 2020 over the uprisings in the wake of George Floyd's death. Um, but my interest is communities in general doing that systematic counting 
searching for not just an overlaid sort of history of slavery, but finding out what particularly their ancestors experienced and um, as, as much as possible and really unpacking what it is that they feel they've inherited, what has carried across generation, and thus what needs to be responded to in the present moment. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question, but that is sort of um, why I focus so much on direct lineage. Um, and again, I think I had mentioned this before in my comments, but something that really troubles me about the national sort of like the public discourse around a national plan is the idea that folks um, in, you know, who are determined to be experts on reparations or, you know, our national leaders will be the one to determine what it means to me to heal from the intergenerational, you know, trauma that I hold and that my my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother hold right um rather than me um rather than the folks that i'm in community with who see the ways that legacies show up in our own lives on a day-to-day -day basis um and and you know i focus a lot um, on talking about black folks because i am black and that's my interest but my hope is not that these conversations only exist in those spaces but that they end up taking shape sort of like the conversation we're having right now. Obviously, we're being recorded, we're on a panel, you know, this isn't necessarily a facilitation space, but the hope is that, you know, you, Professor McCurry and Professor McDaniel would be able to join either in your communities or in our institutions, right, at Columbia, um, Yale, where I just came from, and begin to unpack what exactly how exactly the legacies of slavery, again, show up in our own lives um, and what it would mean to repair from those legacies and what it would require of each of us. Um, so those are just some of the, the reasons why I focus on direct lineage. Yeah, I think that's um, just really, really helpful because when you move in and out of these debates, you can often be lost about the nature of the apparent divisions or disagreements. And I think you make a very powerful case tonight, Jordan, and in your legal scholarship um, about uh, the fact that if you put it in the hands of local communities, that, that match between the redistributive, the redistribution of material resources and the, re re the repair of, of injury, mm -hmm. that they can decide what the appropriate nature of that is or form of that is. So that's, um, that's a really important and I think generative way including the, the idea possibly that Caleb having discovered and fleshed out this story of Henrietta Woods would go home to Brandon Hall and become, you know, a, a known part of that history for those people who still live in that community and work there. Um, well, I have to turn to the questions that are coming from the audience, our patient, extremely interested audience. So let me pick through these a little bit and direct them to, to you. So the first question, not named anonymous, asks, uh, this is for you, Caleb, that Henrietta Wood's story shows that debates over reparations are not new, but date back to the era of slavery itself. And the uh, listener, the audience member, wants to know if you could talk a little bit about how the debate changed over the years and what you think some of the turning points or disjunctures are in the development of the reparations movement. Well, that's a great question, and and um, I, I don't building on our uh, earlier conversation about expertise. I wouldn't claim special expertise on on uh, that question or about the movement as a whole, but I, I agree with the the listener that this is a long history, and it's a history that goes back to the very beginnings of slavery uh, in in many cultural and, and national contexts. Um, you know, I think it's it's interesting that to me it was interesting to me to find that some of the arguments being made against um, uh, Wood in the 1870s, there was a lot of newspaper commentary after this suit. And, you know, some of the, the comments that were more hostile to her case said, um, you know, slavery happened a long time ago. Uh, this was, this is an old chapter in our history. And this is in, 18, in 1870, you know, 1878. And so that's an argument that you often hear even today um, against reparations claims, and it was already being made then uh, in the immediate aftermath of legal slavery in the United States. So I think there's there's probably you know more continuity in the opposition to 
reparations claims than there is in the a struggle uh, that advocates had to to make a, a space for reparations um, over time. That was was uh, changing partly in response to different legal regimes, different political alignments, uh, different needs of different communities over time. Um, you know, would would in a way. Her case is uh, a product of this window of opportunity that was created by Reconstruction uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War that really rapidly closed and, and was already closing at the moment that she that she won her suit. Um, the courts became much more hostile to African American litigants, um, and and you know. Um, uh, by the end of the 19th century, I think that's one of the reasons why Callie House and, and her organization turned more to legislative means of, of appealing for redress and petitioning Congress uh, directly. Um, in the early 20th century, there was a shift to more uh, class action lawsuits. There, there was an effort to, for example, to see whether or not the taxes that had been collected on cotton that was left uh, uh, in the fields after the Civil War could be redistributed to those who had been instrumental in, in cultivating and, and bringing that cotton to market. Um, of course, uh, over the course of the 20th century, uh, reparations claims took many different forms in many organizations. I, I was thinking as, as Jordan was speaking about uh, Queen Mother Moore in, in southeastern Louisiana, which uh, I think you know it, she really expanded this conversation in some of the ways that Jordan is discussing about reckoning and culture and history, and not only uh, about uh, compensation as important as restitution is. Um, and then in the beginning of, of this century, of course, there were class action lawsuits against uh, banks and corporations and uh, universities and institutions uh, with, with lots of resources and connections historically to slavery and, and segregation that were, were not uh, welcomed by the courts that heard those, those suits. And so I think that's one reason there's been a shift back now. Uh, on the national level, at least more to rallying around efforts like HR 40 and in the House of Representatives to uh, create a commission to study the effects of slavery and to make recommendations about reparations. Uh, and I think it's really interesting to hear as Jordan speaks about new efforts uh, on the grassroots level online um, beyond that uh, congressional level to to push the conversation in new directions yet again. So I think there's a lot of variety and change over time, uh, but the continuity is that there have always been these demands. Uh, and they, they have uh, been made since before slavery was abolished and in the immediate aftermath of slavery, and that there's always been opposition yeah. uh, from those who stood to profit from uh, an end to those struggles. Yeah, you're uh, one of the when when we were planning for this lecture series, my friend and colleague Frank Garidi suggested that I listen to this lecture by the preeminent uh, West Indian historian Hillary Beckles, and it was at a reparations conference, and it was incredibly powerful. And one of the first things he said is that there's been six or seven spikes in demands for reparations between the first emancipation generation and today in the Caribbean. Uh, that it's not new, it's one of the oldest political movements in the Caribbean, uh, and, um, uh, and, and I guess it is here too, and I think it's interesting to watch that movement from the local back to the national, the judicial to the legislative. We have a wonderful question here that I think goes to you, uh, Jordan, which connects to this. Um, one person, Eleanor, asks, if you know, if anyone has thought about using some of these forgotten historical lawsuits and decisions as legal precedents in contemporary court cases. And she asked you, Jordan, uh, as a graduate of Yale Law School, do you, do you know of any work being done along those lines of a way of, I guess, reanimating these historical cases um, as legal precedents? Ah, I, I have to say, I haven't heard of utilizing these cases as legal precedent, in part because I and I can even think not necessarily of the historical, but Deidre Farmer Paleman, um, who P Professor McDaniel was mentioning, the lawsuits against those major corporations like Aetna and J.P. Morgan and all of those, 
um, those failed. Those lawsuits were unsuccessful. And so I'm not really sure if utilizing those cases as precedent would really work in a case. But what I can tell you about um, something that really interests me, um, I'm sure um, many of you have heard about the fight for reparations in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, uh, I know that that sort of recently resurfaced, uh, resurged in the sort of popular media. Um, but the attorneys that are representing Justice for Greenwood, which is a grassroots organization similar to the ones that I describe and the ones that I'm trying to support right now and the work that I do, um, that has been um, for decades, you know, for probably almost nearly a century now, been tr constantly um, reanimating this call for reparations. Um, their attorneys recently filed litigation they filed a complaint rather um, in, I think it was September of 2020, um, to basically utilize um, a, a different type of claim that I had never really used or heard used before in reparations discourse, which is around public nuisance. Public nuisance uh, is predominantly in property law, right? Um, the, a popular case, a popular example of a nuisance case is, you know, uh, a group of people are living in a community and they build a cow farm next door and the methane, the farts from the cows, you know, are released into the air and cause, you know, um, a nuisance that then they need to go to court to sort of, you know, grapple with that conflict. Um, but it's interesting about that case, the attorneys, um, I forget his name, um, but the attorneys in that case basically argue that the Tulsa massacre, the, the, the act of violence itself, was the start of a public nuisance that continued from 1921 to the present day, and that um, essentially the, the city of Tulsa, the state of Oklahoma, and other um, named defendants were responsible for that nuisance and had to pay damages um, because of the nuisance that they caused. And my understanding is that they used that public nuisance claim because of the success of Johnson & Johnson, um, the opioid um, settlement that recently happened in Oklahoma. Um, and that utilized the public nuisance claim. Um, but I have not had a chance to actually interpret interact with their attorneys. I just sort of, um, you know, look at them gleefully from afar and, and look forward to seeing how the remainder of that um, litigation process goes. Um, but I would argue as well, and sort of what um, my belief is, is that I'm not so certain that um, repair for the legacies of centuries of injustice will come through the very courts that committed these very atrocities, um, right? We're talking about um, the complexities even in Henrietta Woods' case and the facts that, you know, she sought $20,000 in damages um, and not only was she, you know, forced to only act or request monetary compensation, but she didn't even get what she had asked for in the beginning. And so I think about that shortcoming in her story, you know, as guiding this work in the present, you know, um, in terms of unpacking whether or not the judicial branch is going to be the avenue through which I and my descendants seek, you know, repair and healing. That well, sort of uh, reminds right. me, in, yeah. oh, it kind of connects back to the, the earlier question about was this a, a case of reparations? You know, one interesting question is, why did the jury only award Wood a fraction of uh, the amount she was asking? It's not really clear. You know, in, in this case file, you don't get the, the jurors explaining their, their reasoning uh, about that. But at least one of the hypotheses in the press was that they had decided to limit their assessment of damages to the act of kidnapping uh, that Wood had suffered in 1853. Uh, and did not uh, buy the argument that Wood and her lawyers were making that all of the wages that she had lost after 1853 and all the damages she had suffered uh, at the hands of Gerard Brandon or you know others um, that that she had encountered after uh, being sold into slavery by Zebulon Ward, they decided you know to set that aside. Um, and so there is a sense in which you know one can argue, one can wonder. Um, legally, uh, whether even the amount that Wood received was the kind of, of reparative uh, act that uh, Wood was was desiring, uh, I think, by by filing this petition and making this claim. Well, I think you both make a really pretty powerful argument here about um, the courts, um, but I'm especially struck by Jordan's thinking through uh, various legal strategies, like the eminent domain strategy of your of your paper. 
and this idea of nuisance, and it seems no less far-fetched to me than the fact that we got some of our most important constitutional rights through weird streams of uh, uh, law, like privacy and you know things like this. That or the interstate, the commerce clause. You know, it seems no more crazy to me than that. Um, but we have a great question here, a very obvious one, uh, um, uh, important one that uh, 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 Logan uh, in the audience picked up on listening to the two of you. And here it is. She, they say, gave something away there maybe, so many of the leaders of the early reparations movement seem to have been Black women. Henrietta yeah. Wood, Callie House, Belinda Sutton, those are three examples mentioned tonight. Why do you think women in particular took on this work? I might say, was it particularly Black women who took on this work, or are we just um, ourselves selecting those cases tonight? Is there something to that perception? Either Gosh. one of you. Jordan, why don't you go? Yeah, it's fun. I'm sorry. I said yes so quickly when you said <laughs> That's that good. Note in my note. <laughs> and I cite, um, I forget the name of the professor. I think her name's Ana Lucia, if I'm my apologies uh, for the oh. name, yes, um, who wrote a short article about the fact that many of um, our early reparations leaders were in fact Black women. Um, and I'm not a historian, so I, this is conjecture, but I mean, I can think about, you know, the experience of, you know, being enslaved in post-emancipation, right? And um, thinking about, you know, the ways in which Black men were um, subject to all sorts of violences, lynchings and convict leasing. And those are things that Black women experienced as well. But I mean, I, I could guess that perhaps maybe they were locked into other forms of disenfranchisement. I also think, and this is really the more important truth, that Black women have always been at the forefront of every social movement for healing, for the benefit of all. You think of the Kambahi River Collective who wrote, you know, essentially that Black women, once Black women are free, we're all free. Um, and I think that that resonates, obviously, in the reparations movement. Um, it resonates to the present. Um, the work that I do, working with descendants in the river parishes, has primarily been around, as I described before, seeding a conversation around reparations, but also supporting the ongoing environmental justice work that Black women, and particularly Black women over the age of 50, you know, older Black women are doing. And, and it was really confusing to me at first why, you know, Ms. Barbara, Ms. Gale, Ms. Sharon, and all of these amazing women, why they had come to the work. But when I spoke with them, it's because they are they are not um, career social justice warriors. They are community members. Yeah. They are the mothers and grandmothers of their communities. And in this situation that I'm working on, you know, they're fighting to protect both the land, the air, the soil, right, um, the water from petrochemical destruction, and also fighting to protect um, the their enslaved ancestors' burial grounds, which are currently being desecrated by corporations such as Formosa, Greenfield, and others. Um, and and so, yeah, I think the reason why Black women are in these positions and historically are the same reasons why we continue to have to be in these positions in the present, because no one else honestly has shown up for us in the ways that they might need to. And that, in fact, could be a larger discussion around what reparative justice could look like, both in a local context and a national one. No, but I that's think, my hot take. No, I think you're right. I mean, and it clearly... Um, women as keepers of cultural memory is one way in which that seems to be a role, not natural, but socially embraced. Mm -hmm. We're absolutely running out of time. I'm gonna squeeze in one more question. It's a big one. So we have uh, two minutes left, but what, an, an anonymous audience member says, Henrietta's living descendants didn't know about her existence or much about her story until Professor McDaniel's research led him to them. What do the panelists, you two, think the impact will be of efforts to recover the lost stories of enslaved people in terms of discovering the true history of America? Now, that's a huge question, but it's a pointed one at the moment when the very matter of recovering and teaching this particular history of, of, of enslavement is, is again controversial. So a minute each, a quick answer or a quick first thought from each of you. Caleb, would you start? Well, I, I think, you know, it goes straight to what, what Jordan was saying about the very local understandings of, uh, you know, what a particular family endured, what a particular community endured. I think it's really important to, uh, you know, uncover as many of these stories as, as we can. 
Um, and, you know, it, it's incumbent on us as, as professional historians as much as possible to, to share what we learn uh, and to also uh, be in collaboration and cooperation with genealogists who are, who are doing this kind of work. It's in, in a lot of ways, I feel um, it's, it's certainly true, and I'm sure this will come up in, in many of your conversations in this series this, series this year, that uh, the violence uh, of the archive of slavery means that it is shot through with uh, silences and, and distortions. Um, and yet we're at a moment where the, the you know, digitization of uh, many uh, records that have not been uh, digitized or widely accessible before, like the recently released records of the Freedmen's Bureau that, that have been placed on Ancestry.com, uh, mean that you know, it's, it's not impossible to, to find uh, uh, many of these stories and, and reconstruct them. Um, of course, not perfectly. Uh, and even in Wood's case, as you read the book, uh, you, you see that there, there are many things that we, we can't know, including what she thought about the final outcome of her case. Um, I do think that this work is, is important to do um, and to make it as, as open as possible. And um, one of the things I, I determined to do at the beginning of my book was to share the notes that I was taking as I was conducting research on an open access uh, website, a wiki that that uh, is available. It's one of the ways that um, you know readers can go and learn a little bit more about um, some of the sources involved in the book. And and uh, I'm encouraged to see so many projects now that are connecting these research projects. Uh, Enslaved.org, for example, of looking at uh, you know data that's being collected about different. Uh, uh, descendant communities, different plantation communities, and seeing if we can can link up those stories. Uh, so I think it's uh, it connects well with with Jordan's points about the importance of of being very local and uh, very close to the the personal stories and talking about these big issues. Well, I'm afraid, Jordan, we're going to have to in imagine the brilliant answer you would have given us to that because I'm sure it would not be a thirty second uh, thought. So I am at this point going to thank both of you and the audience for these amazing questions and return the floor to Anne Thornton. Thank you so much to Jordan Brewington, Caleb McDaniel, and Stephanie McCurry for their informative and engaging discussion on reparative justice and its important role in our nation's evolution. As Professor McCurry mentioned earlier, the Lehman Center for American History at Columbia University has an exceptional year of public programming planned between now and next spring, which we invite you to learn more about on their relaunched website at lehmancenter.history.columbia.edu. And the QR code that you see on your screen will take you to the website I also want to call your attention to an important new archival acquisition made by our rare book and manuscript library, highlighted in a Columbia news publication last week. The archival document, which has been digitized uh, and is available on our site, addresses a 1790s lawsuit brought in New York by a formerly enslaved woman named Nellie Mumford seeking reparation for abuse and theft of her freedom papers. The 18th century date of the legal decision in her favor is further evidence of a point made very clear by our panelists this evening, that the drive for justice by those whose rights were similarly denied has been powerful from the very early days of our country's history. We will include a link to information about this important document in our follow-up email to everyone who registered for this event. And in closing, I want to thank all of you for, for joining us this evening. Please be well and stay safe.